seated. We will proceed with uh, today's special program momentarily. There are just a few announcements. First, about soup kitchen. The student council at 25 students preparing a piece of ham, casserole, green beans, mashed potatoes, and gravy, biscuits, and pudding. They served 157 patrons, Mr. Chenery, uh, Dr. Morrow, Mr. Thrillkill represented the faculty, Adam Delizer and Alan Callison provided the much needed senior leadership. Many thanks to all who continue to participate, especially on a Saturday when there are a lot of other important events going on. I appreciate that. Remember the coat drive. Remember the uh, request to help out our friend Edith in the kitchen and her family. I wanted to mention a Shakespeare contest that will take place tomorrow morning during activity period 9.45 a.m. The finals, two sophomores, Ben Pope, Chris Schuller, uh, Andrew Kaiser, and Tommy McGinn will be competed, competing in those finals. Uh, we are very proud of our wrestling team. I know they're disappointed after losing an extremely close match, but they came back to beat Father Ryan. Uh, finishing third in the state. Uh, we'll have a full report next week. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Great basketball and hockey victories this weekend. Uh, there will be a brief meeting of those interested in running track right at the end of assembly uh, down front here on my left. A uh, few notes finally about the week. Uh, class meetings on Wednesday, varsity swimming region competitions at Sportsplex Thursday and Friday, and Duke Ellington concert this Sunday uh, afternoon, 4 p.m. here in the theater. Code of applications are available in the main office today and must be returned by next Monday. If you applied for Code of last year and would like to be considered again, please update your application. I am reminding you now that this series, um, there will be five this year, this is the second, uh, was instigated by Mr. Barfield who's sitting up uh, there and Mr. UC who's sitting down here on my left. Uh, to Five ways in which we would uh, enlarge our understanding of how individuals make choices about their lives and their careers. And so we've asked a number of people to come in for these uh, conversations, interviews, and invite you uh, to ask some questions. So with that, uh, please uh, welcome formally now Dr. Fritz and Mr. Yuki and thank them for being here this morning. Uh, Brad, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, Dr. Fritz, we really appreciate your taking time from your schedule to join your alma, alma mater uh, here at NBA today. Uh, and as, as the headmaster mentioned, uh, the only ground rule is, is that we do have two microphones, so as we go on this morning, if you have a question you'd like to ask of Dr. Fritz, please go to one of the microphones, and we'll recognize as many people as time permits. I thought we might begin, uh, Dr. Fritz, with perhaps your uh, telling us this morning about two or three decisions that you made during your life uh, that were most important to you. First, uh, I need to correct, make sure something is not included up here. I have a, a father who's on the board of trust for many years and a uh, great, great uh, cardiologist, wonderful father, wonderful, hey, two great parents. Hey, uh, two brothers are great with me. The reason I'm saying that, both of them want to be doctors. I want to make it clear that the son, everybody talks about it out here, is not my son, but he's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> he's a 15 year mistake. <laughs> he's behind him, mother and dad weren't playing on him when he was 41, when he was 41 years of age. Now, go ahead. You, you asked what I, I, there, I thought maybe to put this in context, you could tell us if there were two or three decisions you made most important. Uh, three really important decisions. We haven't heard this now. Yeah. Uh, it's 24 hours in the day. Uh, when you get a little bit older, eight hours is going to be, or even now, but 
Hey, I'm just going to be with your family. So, uh, uh, at home. So, uh, be sure you marry the right wife. You probably have the right child. That's eight hours a day. Another eight hours a day, uh, you're going to will be at work. Make sure you find out what you want to do or try and determine what you want to do in life. That's a very important decision. Uh, very important, whether it's going to be a doctor, coach, preacher, whatever. Uh, but probably the most important is eight hours a day you're going to sleep. Unless you're my brother said, he only takes four hours a day. But if that's true, get a good mattress. <laughs> Tell me, I know, that, I know when you, you know, that class 56, that you were the uh, quarterback on the NBA team and were active in athletics, and I'm wondering if there were aspects of team sports that you think taught you lessons that were really important. Sports was pretty important. Back in the NBA, it was an entirely different NBA in 55, 56. Um, that was before the, uh, uh, my that we have here, man. You know, scholar, athlete. Um, sports was, was it. We didn't have any role models. My role model then was Coach Owen. He was football and basketball coach. He taught you discipline, he taught you preparation, all the things you almost take for granted today is in the whole total environment, being at NBA. Uh, but it certainly the team sport aspect of leadership, sacrifice, working together, all those invaluable throughout my lifetime. So that's probably was the most uh, important thing during my formative years at NBA was, was sports matter. But I would hasten very quick to say it's not team sports. Team sports is one aspect of it that you don't want to miss. Uh, it could be soccer or any team sport. But the other thing is sports in general. Uh, much of my life, uh, tennis was here with big for me, and throughout much of my life, uh, played a lot of tennis and so forth, but, but the, uh, the more than that was the running aspect. To me, uh, you would not think of me as a runner or a quarterback, because that was like a tackle or a tight end or something. But, uh, but uh, all much throughout my life, uh, until the last two years, because of a joint problem, I was running, not the running was a discipline too. You'd run, from time I was 40 to 45, I averaged 10 miles a day. That wasn't 10 miles, that wasn't an hour and a half out of my day wasted. That's the time of my business career. So what, that's my time to do my strategic playing, my thinking, while keeping myself aerobically fit. It was only on the weekends that I would do, do it with other people in a social environment and run the marathon. But you know, coming in your early career, there obviously are sort of two parts of it. One is, your medicine, the other was your obvious interest in entrepreneurial things. So what are we making first if we can talk about why was it that you decided to go to medical school and become a physician? I, was, I grew up in a physician family, so, you know, that, it never occurred to me I wouldn't go into medicine. I would hear my father talk to other people say, well, medicine is such a great career. You can practice medicine, you can do research, you can be a teacher, you can, can uh, be a businessman, you can be a very successful physician he was, but also his hobbies on vacation were to go find a piece of real estate to buy it, or buy an old building and turn it into a beautiful new building and rent it. So it was giving him security of the income and that, but then it let him contribute back something into society and so forth. But, but some medicine, that, that was a, I just never thought that that was, uh, I didn't do anything other than that. I didn't, I had other goals that I thought the medicine would give me a platform of which to achieve uh, in my life. It turned out because of other influence of Mr. Manson, who you see his name out here, Jack Manson was a patient of my father's. And uh, uh, he bought Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was a young, uh, in college. And before it ever went public. And he would give a few shares to my parents. They give them to the children rather than my mother and father. Well, I just watched that. And I'd go and thank Mr. Mancy uh, back when I was in college and then medical school and all of a sudden the stock came public, did great things. But Mr. Mancy 
And without knowing it, Saturday became a role model in many ways because he was a very successful entrepreneurial business person. So I sat there and watched him, and he would give things back that many entrepreneurs wouldn't have made thought from a loose the next day. He's very generous in his own property. That thing. So when he wrote me after I was uh, in the military in the Vietnam War and said, Tommy, chicken, medicine, make up your mind soon. He's trying to get me to come back and not go back to my residency, but go to uh, uh, join him at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And that wasn't the time uh, uh, It was only when our father started a company that would reorganize hospitals uh, that I said, well, medicine, hospitals, I love and some other things about it. Um, and we started, while I was in the military, Hospital Corporation of America. Uh, and so I was able to tie my medical degree with my love of business, with my love of, of flying as a, a heavy pilot, as you know, Alan, and all of those things going around acquiring hospitals all over the world. So anyway, that's medicine evolved in until that medical degree in a social service and a, uh, in a, in a company that doesn't manufacture things. We are, we are a service company that has 160, 70,000 employees. The medical background of understanding the psychology of people and what, even when they're sick, what makes them feel a little bit more irritable, what, how people think and react. The medical degree has been invaluable to me uh, as, a, as a backdrop in my business career over the years. I mean, I want to obviously pick up on HCA and just a minute, but let me digress for a second because you mentioned flying, and I know from having flown with you as a major, major interest of yours. Could you maybe share with us a little about why that's been such an important and meaningful kind of application? First thing I was passionate about flying when I was in college. That's very old. You never talk about very financial goals or any goals. You just, I don't know. Um, I, very, Set goals even today, setting goals over the weekend for the next few years. I never talk about it. But anyway, I always had these goals and didn't know how I was going to reach it. Now, I ended up in Los Angeles College having a, a business on 108 college campuses where you put a desk slot out so big you sell, sell uh, little two by three ads, you know, those Miles Laboratory, know those stay awake kids, so you can stay awake kids. That's a football. Schedule of Oklahoma State or something like that. I got stuck in Stillwater, Oklahoma. I had to deliver those bottles before I could collect from Jarman Shoe. $3,000 to pay off my debt. I had to go out to Stillwater, Oklahoma, or Rutgers, or wherever it was, and I got stuck. There was only one flight out of Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I ended up missing that flight, spending the night on the couch when I was 20 years of age in college. I came back and said, I'm never going to depend on the airline again. So without my parents, I was one, I got my college license in history. Nine thousand, ten thousand hours later, and seven or eight thousand hours of jet time, and flying, uh, I have an airline transport rating and things like that. And, and it's really neat, it's a, it's a, it's a window into the world. Uh, you, you can be in the Bahamas one day, you can be in Anchorage, Alaska, or Rome, Alaska, or somewhere the next, or you can be in Reykjavik, and you fly your planes, you just, the one, the practical aspect of it for me, building a company, beating the competition in the market, uh, showing people around. But more importantly, I found out earlier that the brother who's a son that went on from MBA, my father wouldn't let, my parents discouraged me back then. I'm going to brother make the dick line. Back when I was in the I thought I'd come back to comics. <laughs> the long hair and And 15 years later, I went off to Washington University Medical School. I found out it's very important and important to get away geographically, see other things. And so I encouraged my parents to let my brother go to Princeton and go you know, to Harvard and medical school and Stanford for postgraduate and all of that. But he, I got him when he was 16 years of age, come down as a flight instructor at that time in the military and taught him how to fly. I saw him get in Princeton a lot because of that. And all of my children have their power flights. After, because I found out while there are many dollars and many uh, all city quarterbacks and that type of thing around the country, there were very few applying to Ivy's uh, or to medical school or later or whatever that had been self started enough, enough discipline to 16, 17 years of age to the college place. So there's this practical aspect. 
You know, let me remind you, we do have a mic, so if you would like to ask a question, please approach that and we'll uh, let you have a discussion down here. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that Dr. Fritz is not only the founder of the largest healthcare provider in the country. Oh, you're a terrible role model. Dude, everything I have to say is different. I've got a little cheap plane. Maybe I'll never turn the hell away. You see me flying under the bridge. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but Tommy, you also, in effect, invented an industry because as many as people may probably don't appreciate, a hospital was really up until 1968 were basically not for profit organizations. So the idea of having an investor own hospital was really a, an innovative idea. And I'm curious, what was it that gave you the idea that there was a market opportunity? Well, first place, when I was 14, 15 years old, back then, we drove to Florida. They were friends in my parents' house and so forth. I had a, uh, in Mason, Georgia, shop one time and heard a man didn't even know what he was saying. Uh, he, he was sitting on the couch in a, in a library and he, he was talking about how he wasn't going to get married to certain things. I set certain goals in myself uh, back then as a 14 year old. Didn't know exactly um, uh, how I was going to achieve those. And so I, all through the NBA, all through the band, I kept trying to, uh, to uh, different things, starting different businesses or whatever. And uh, I was drafted in the military, out of, out of my lessons in Vanderbilt, and I remember uh, for the first time being very focused on pre-med medical school, I mean, I had some time to think in the, during the Vietnam War, and I realized there were 4,000 hospitals independently operated as a cottage industry while brokers and uh, various things that we organized into a more efficient, productive type of, of uh, vehicle. And then I remember a fraternity brother of mine at Vanderbilt Farm had started Holiday Inns of America and changed what we used to do when I traveled to Florida. We stayed in a hotel with my guest house going to Florida. Yeah, I found that he changed and they actually started calling hotels, called hotels. Motor cars, stuff in hotels. Changed the whole lease of field. Yeah. I guess what it NBA would be a violation of our code. I plagiarized the concept. And even rather than call it Holiday Inn of America, I called it Hospital Corporation of America, which is HTA, and brought that concept. Now the important lesson I like to me is always look around. You don't know who's sitting next to you. And I look back at Florida now, my days at NBA, and think, well, that guy's a nerd. That guy ended up the nerd, the head of the top law firm in, in the country. Another nerd, top minister. You know, and all the same way in college or in my life later on. And here's the thing you look around and you learn from your, your associates, the people you're with, that's one of the values of being in here. And so, well, that guy. Pick up a, a lot of things uh, over the years I've done, uh, observing the range, even if you become an investor, especially the best is to decide what you use yourself and go out and buy it and stop. You, you, you see trends. Uh, question here, please. Uh, Dr. Fritz, I recently read the short book written as a eulogy to your father, and uh, I was wondering uh, obviously, he passed on many of his personal values to you. Uh, which of those values do you think has been most important to your success? What they're talking about is, is uh, to you science people, uh, people uh, others, people often ask uh, how I got to be the uh, be head one top 100 companies in the country or whatever. And I used to be a big because I was an SOB. The son of the boss. <laughs> I, I happened to have won the old American lottery. I had the right parents. And, uh, and so over the years, uh, my mentor was my father, my mother. Uh, they were the role models. I was blessed with that. And we didn't have a lot of money when I grew up, by the way. We were going to Florida. Uh, we, we really came back. We, we had to drive all night because there wasn't there. But one being work ethic and all the different things you learn here. It, it sounds so old and bright and the shades, but I never, I never, in all my life, 
remember, this is a great thing, I don't think you should prepare for it, not going to say that, but, but I never remember my father misleading or kind of something wrong. I, if he, somebody gave me extra candy chain to the convenience food store, he'd give it back. Uh, obviously, the honesty, the integrity, but the, both of them right to their death were concrete, nothing about themselves but other people. It just, that whole book, it, I put it together really because of, uh, you can't tell your children what to do. Uh, they have to learn by example, take going on trips with the children, grandchildren, whatever. And I just wanted to put that down, that particular book, so the grandchildren and the generation to come will have those values. Pretty good. You know, since Andy has asked about this, uh, Tommy, I know that one of the things in that book is a letter from your dad to his grandchildren. I'm like, have you ever written similar letters to your children, and if so, what are some of the things you might talk about? Well, I remember from my Vietnam years how nice it was to occasionally get letters from my parents. And so from the time my daughter was now 37 to my son, to, uh, what's your name? Zach. Zach? Uh, Billy was a state wrestling champ here at, at NBA. He got him. He won it in the last upset. And he got him one two high. He would have otherwise just winning that championship on top two in the country. And uh, and so uh, <laughs> <laughs> about about whether you have written. Oh, oh yeah. So, <laughs> so what I did then? Every one of my children was never get old. Uh, the, uh, every one of my children, when they went off, I never missed a day of writing a letter to them or postcard while they were off in college. I didn't want them. I remember Billy, my youngest brother, talking about his first year at Princeton and how lonely he was, a southern boy, to Princeton and hear the bell, the bell stole at night. And it wasn't the right thing to be up there at Princeton. So I never, at least, I wanted to have a postcard or something, and I didn't know it, and all my children, but now I got almost a diary of just boxes full of those postcards from their four years in, in college. That's kind of a mechanism that I have. Now, you can reverse that, by the way, and write to parents. And also. Yes. I think you have to point that mic down just a little. Has your greatest achievement been in your career or with your family? I'm not sure. I, I know about greatest achievement, so I'll just take off the off the. And with your career or family? Oh, uh, great achievement has to be uh, the family. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I was being a little facetious, but not uh, when I was talking about the most important decision is who you your spouse, who you get. I mean, most important, maybe, you know, job and all that. But, but uh, uh, fortunately, I picked the right wife in the family and, and uh, never went on a vacation. I can't remember without the children and that type of thing. But that, that's there. I would say there has to be the, uh, uh, the fun and excitement of starting your own company that, that grew. And, and not so much the financial aspect of it. It lets you do other things like Mr. Nancy taught me and others. He gave me the wherewithal to do like a visual arts and uh, one of the next things I'd like to see the next will do is do uh, just anything. So business, but probably the most rewarding is this electric the total society they talk up here about up here. When I was uh we're gonna back ten minutes. When I was through uh when I was about thirty three years of age. I knew that HCA was just a certain point that may let me do things even more than I thought outside the community. So I went and asked someone that I admired to give me some advice on things I ought to get involved in. He said, okay, Tommy, if I were you, I would pick one school, the NBA, to be on the board, I would get involved. In. What about a higher education? Well, I could go to Washington University where I went to medical school or Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, Nashville, we had a top company to pick that. Art to Kennedy Center in Washington. I had to pick a social service. So I picked uh, uh, United Way because it was on hard time. You could have done the Salvation Army 
And all of you are involved in any of you. Worthwhile things I admire that very much. That's wonderful. We didn't do that back then. I haven't picked the United Way. I used that as a pyramid to go first place, turn it around here. And in doing that, something I've always done is when I take all of a task, I used to have a primary objective. And then I used to be in running something. Or anything you want to do. But then you never you may have that out front. Raise so much money from the United Way and that. Something you don't say is you've got a hidden goal. At least the high risk goal. One in a hundred. During that United Way campaign back in 81 and 82, if I do something innovative, creative, maybe that would have a ripple effect around the nation. Well, lo and behold, it came up with a hook, a hook or something that makes it like a, 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 a song, a hit. Well, my hook in that thing was set the Lexington Social Society that leadership given. That went on, not just for Nashville, made the top campaign in the country, which my goal here was to have a good campaign here, top in the country, but then the Lexington Social Society today now in over 300 communities and it's very little added cost it raises about $600 million a year. In perpetuity, every year, this machine is there uh, making a lot of people's lives better. So that, that probably gives me as much satisfaction as anything. The Community Foundation, we started, the Frisch Foundation, uh, let you do some neat things you might not otherwise. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. The, uh, well, how, what I'm hearing is how do you, how can you uh, uh, make a profit and look at societal needs, particularly in the hospital sector, uh, if you're making a profit? Uh, as a matter of fact, you, if you don't make a profit, if you don't have a sound balance sheet, you can't provide a service. And it's a figment of imagination, the fact that you are uh, uh, St. Thomas or Baptist or whatever, or Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt made 40, 50 million all year. They didn't pay taxes. They, nothing wrong with that. It's just a misnomer. It's, it's a profit out there, but it's, one's in a taxable environment, one's not. But cash flow wise, I mentioned right now. But basically, you have to have a positive, positive value. So that's not an issue. All hospitals today, not going to start, but all of them have to take the same amount of care to do the research or because if that's their mission. And so with that time, it's my biggest disappointment after five decades in healthcare is I still think, and I had a glimmer of hope by the way, that it's going to be solved until 911. My greatest disappointment is this greatest richest nation in the world still uh, has 40 to 45 million uninsured. They're taken care of. It's not a compassionate, kind health care system. That's unconscious. And the thing to me is the politicians still are saying, oh, some of them, we want to take care of them, take care in this state. If you read about that issue, they're really not really doing what I think. They're not going far enough. Because you have a lot, a lot of ex-patriots, you have Mexicans, Hispanics, Kurds, a lot of different people throughout this great nation of ours, and they're human beings too. And all the problems even the talk about it solving is not like they have in the United Kingdom or other places where if you're really sick, you come in and you're taken care of. Yeah, Tommy, I, I suspect that it's people here in the audience go to college, graduate school, graduate, some number will end up in large organizations. And of course, HCA at one point was the seventh largest employer in the United States, still one of the largest employers. In terms of people who have been managers under your leadership, can you share with the students what qualities you have seen that have caused people to be the most effective executives on your leadership team? First place, you don't have to have Harvard, Princeton, Yale. The best people we have at HGA are coming out of Hill, Tennessee, Tennessee Tech, David Lips, some place like that, to come into the county, and 99 out of 100 are going to be happy if there's control of the hospital. The so one out of 100 to break through the ceiling can be present of the organization. So while I say always go the best, if you can go to Harvard, go there. If you're dying the best, go there. Always anything in life, go for the best. It's not necessarily that grassroots values that you have from Middle Tennessee 
work ethic, honesty, integrity, all those type things that are important. But, uh, I mean, the least of the books on it is absolutely the fact. And, and to me, uh, uh, when I came back, for instance, in August of 97, H.J. was almost after being gone for three and a half years, almost like the Enron story that many of you may read about now. Uh, and we saved it and got it back to right values and the uh, right mission and values out there for 160,000 employees. When people ask me today what was the one most important thing we did, it wasn't just another 14, not 16 officers when I came back, or redoing the bank lines or whatever. It was sitting down for a week and a half, two weeks, and drafting a new mission and value center. That would be good to put it up on the wall and just talk about it. If you don't live, breathe, eat, sleep, whatever, that's the one most important thing that we did. It saved a $20 billion company. And uh, it, it was a very important. Because it's an awesome thing to die forever. It changes people's lives. That company was almost lost because it almost lost its way. It didn't have that common, that common thread that blew through out of it. It says we care about the dignity of the individual, honesty, uh, truth, integrity, all those things. Uh, thank you. Let me, let me ask you one wrap-up question because we're about at the end of our time, which is you have accomplished so much in, uh, in your lifetime. Are there two or three things that you regard as your primary accomplishments and that you'd like to vote to remember for? You can't go as I am. That's the question he had. <laughs> I thought, I, I just think, it never ends. I was sports, flying, and I like about flying. You keep going, you keep learning, whatever. Today, at 63 years of age, that's the age when Mr. Matthew started at HBA with myself and Dad. And he constantly, I don't know, when I heard Giuliani asked that asked this question not long ago, or the two or three friends, I thought he was brilliant in his answer. For a while, what are you going to do next? And he's very honest about it. He's been so busy in trying to address 911 so forth. He's going to the funerals and all the different things there uh, involved with it. He really hasn't had time to think about it. So he knows there's something else out there for him. And I hope, whatever, the little that maybe has happened, I hope it gets to me. Would you please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Christian? Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Dr. Chris. It's great to have you at our assembly and to hear about issues ranging from uh, running and the discipline and flying, uh, business, charitable giving, and family. And uh, you gave us a lot to consider, so we appreciate that.